G'day McGrathletes, welcome back to another Extension 1 Maths video. Today we're doing a revision video on inverse functions, looking at some HSC questions from easy E1s up to some challenging E3, E4 questions, covering pretty much the whole topic. Uh, this video was requested by my student, Joel Dave, so J Money, hopefully you get some value out of this and you become a pro at inverse functions, which I reckon you probably already are. Okay, let's start off with the first one coming to us from 2016. This is the easiest inverse question I could find from recent HSC. It's two marks. Find the inverse function of y equals x cubed minus two. Um, as always, if you know how to do some of these, um, best value from these videos is to pause, have a go yourself, and then compare your solution with mine to see if we are hopefully close, hopefully the same thing. Okay, and anytime you want to find the inverse of a function algebraically, all you need to do is swap your variables. Y becomes x, x becomes y, it looks like this. There's a little voice crack there. Would you believe I'm 30 years old-ish? Okay, now the goal is to just rearrange this equation to make y the subject, and that will be our inverse function. So we're going to add the two across to join the x. We're going to swap the sides, and then we just gotta do, if y cubed is x plus two, we'll just do the cube root of both sides and say therefore y equals the cube root of x plus two. And that right there is our inverse function for two marks. So just swap your variables, rearrange, piece of cake. Okay, on to a harder one from a recent 2020 HSC exam. It's a multiple choice at the E2 level. We've got here's our function. We want to find the domain and range of the inverse. Okay, cool trick for these questions is that because going from your function to your inverse is just swapping your x and y variables, the domain and range of your inverse function, the easiest way to find that is to find the domain and range of your function usually and then they're just gonna swap. The domain of the function becomes the range of the inverse, and the range of your function becomes the domain of your inverse. So if we think about the domain of our function, what can we sub into this function and get an answer? We've got a square root of x, and we hopefully know that we can only do the square root of numbers that are non-negative, so zero and bigger. So because we can't do a square root of a negative, the domain of our function is x needs to be zero or bigger. If we think about the range of our function, the output, well, the square root of something always gives you a positive answer. So the square root is always gonna give you zero or bigger, which means one plus a square root is always gonna give you one or bigger, okay? This is always bigger than zero, so this is always bigger than one. So our range is y is greater than or equal to one. Once you figure that out, the answer is pretty easy. We're just gonna swap them and say the range of the inverse is y greater than zero from this and our domain is x greater than or equal to one from this. So the x and y just swapping, which is why option C is the correct answer. Well done if that's the one that you picked. Okay, next up from the 2012 HSC, uh, we have a function, We've got a bunch of questions. First one is find the domain of f of x for one mark. Okay, so once again, domain is what we can sub into our function. We can only put positive values or zero into a square root. So that means four x minus three needs to be greater than or equal to zero, which means four x needs to be bigger than three by putting that across. Divide by four, and now x needs to be greater than or equal to three quarters. You can write your answer like this, or you can write it in interval notation from three quarters up to infinity. Either of these answers would be getting you one mark for this question. Part two or part B is find the expression for the inverse function. So once again, we are going to algebraically um, find our inverse function by swapping the variables. So we're starting off with changing the x to a y and changing the y to an x. Now, once again, we are going to rearrange this to make y the subject and that will be our inverse function. So we're gonna start off by squaring both sides to get x squared equals four y minus three. Add the three across and then swap the sides. So we get four y by itself. We get x squared plus three and then just divide by four. And that right there is our inverse function. You can write it like this or you can use the fancy notation f with the minus one. Either of those is a fine answer, but that right there is our inverse function from our starting point up here. Okay, part C, find the points on the graph where the function and y equals x intersect. Okay, this is gonna be useful later on when we sketch the function and the inverse because the function and the inverse always intersect on the line y equals x because that's where the y and the x are equal. So if you swap them, you get the same thing. So the way we're gonna solve this is we're gonna set the function equal to x and we're gonna solve that equation. We're basically setting this equation equal to this equation and then solving for x. So function equal to x looks like this. Now we're just going to solve this equation. We're going to square both sides to get x squared equals four x minus three. 
Now we have a quadratic equation, so we'll move everything over to the left-hand side to have x squared minus the 4x plus the 3, and now we have equal to 0. This quadratic can be factorized, which is why this one's only one mark, because it's not too hectic. We can uh, have our factors as minus 3 and minus 1 to look like this. And so then our solutions for x are 1 and 3 inside these brackets. And so because the y value is equal to the x value, that means our points are just 1, 1 and 3, 3. So these are the two points on the line y equals x, where in the next part, our function and its inverse are going to intersect. Okay, they always intersect on the line y equals x. So part C, we're now going to, for two marks, sketch the function and its uh, inverse. Okay, the hardest part is really just knowing how to sketch the square root of something. Okay, so a square root is kind of like the top half of a sideways parabola. You can get your um, x-intercept by setting this equal to zero and solving. If you do that, you should get three quarters. So your graph looks like this, okay? It's the top half of a sideways parabola with an x-intercept of 0 0.75, okay? In case that was too quick, again, the way I got that three quarters here was by setting this equal to zero and then solving for x. Okay, now we know from part C that this function and its inverse are going to intersect along this line, y equals x, which hits at 1, 1, and 3, 3. Now, to sketch your inverse, all you're going to do is reflect this blue line across the red line. So the x-intercept of 0 0.75 is going to become a y-intercept of 0 0.75. And instead of going like this, we're going to go like this. So it's kind of like we're folding our page in half and the x-axis is becoming the y-axis. So our inverse looks like this. Okay? So anytime you have a function and you want to sketch the inverse, all you need to do is reflect across the line uh, in red, y equals x. Okay, and that right there gets you two marks. One mark for being able to sketch the blue line, one mark for sketching the inverse with the intersection points at 1, 1, and 3, 3. Okay, that was an E2, E3, so getting a bit hectic. This next one is a full E3. This is from 2008, so a pretty old question now. We've got a function. This is a parabola. It's a quadratic equation. Uh, X is less than or equal to 1, so we only have a part of the function, not the entire thing. The function has an inverse, okay? Because we've restricted the domain so that this um, parabola, we're only gonna have half of it actually. If you restrict the domain of a parabola, then you're gonna have an inverse function. Okay, sketch the graphs of the function and the inverse on the same set of axes. That's quite a lot of work for two marks. Let's start off by sketching the parabola, but we're only gonna sketch the parabola for x less than or equal to one. Easiest way to sketch a parabola is to start off by finding your x-intercepts. And so the way we're going to do that is we're going to set the function equal to zero like this. Okay, now to solve this, there's a couple ways you can do it. I'm going to multiply everything by two because I don't like fractions. This becomes 2x, this becomes 1x squared. And thankfully, two times zero is still zero. Now, if we factor the left-hand side by taking out the common factor of x, we get x times two minus x equals zero. So our two solutions are zero and two. Okay, so now we know it's a concave down parabola because the x squared is negative. We know it passes through at zero and two, but we're only sketching the left-hand side because if the intercepts are zero and two, that means the turning point is halfway at one. So we're sketching from the turning point, the left-hand side. Okay, so make sure you read your questions very carefully because sometimes they mention a restricted domain. And if you're reading quickly in an exam, you might miss that and you might sketch the whole thing, which is not gonna get you full marks, okay? Because the function is just the left-hand side, just x less than or equal to one. Okay, now that we know how to sketch inverse functions, we're going to put in our line y equals x, and we are going to reflect that blue line across the red line to get our inverse, which looks like this. Okay, blue line and green line are a reflection in the, uh, in the red line, y equals x. The point here, x equals one, is becoming the y value y equals one, and that right there is how we show how to sketch an inverse to get two marks in 2008. Okay, part B is find an expression for the inverse function. So once again, when you're asked to find the inverse function, it means you've got to swap your variables and solve. This one's a bit tricky. Quadratics are always a little bit more advanced, but we can still handle them. So we have y equals x minus half x squared. That's our original function. Our inverse function is going to be swapping the variables. Y becomes x, x has become y. Now the challenging part for three marks is to try and rearrange this equation to make, uh, to make y the subject. Anytime you're doing this with a quadratic, so a square term, you're gonna be doing some form of completing the square. So first thing we're gonna do is tidy up by multiplying everything by two, two x, two y, and one 
minus one, y squared. We're now going to move these two over to the left and move the two x over to the right. So minus y squared becomes y squared, two y becomes negative and two x becomes negative on the right hand side because I want my y squared to be positive. So I've put it on the left hand side. Now we wanna make the left hand side a perfect square. So we're completing the square here by taking minus two. We're gonna cut it in half to make minus one. We're gonna square it to get one and then we're gonna add that to both sides, okay? So if this makes no sense to you, you might wanna brush up on how to complete the square because that's an essential skill for this question. Okay, now the left-hand side can be factorized into y minus one squared. Okay, factorizing the quadratic. Now we just need to do the square root of both sides and we're gonna get a plus and a minus, okay? Now an extra part of this question, which is why this is three marks instead of two, is we need to figure out whether it's the plus or the minus, all right? Um, after we move the one across, sorry, minus one goes across, we have one plus or minus the square root of one minus two x. Now, if we looked at our graph before, the original function had only x less than or equal to one for our original function that was in the question up here. That means for our inverse function, the, uh, the domain is gonna become the range. So now if x is less than one in the original function, in the inverse function, y is less than or equal to one. That's how we know we want small numbers, not big numbers. And that's why we want the minus in this and not the plus. So that's our correct answer. This one right here is not worth three marks, but this one here is. So when you have the plus or minus, you've got to think about your domain or think about your graph to figure out whether you want the top half or the bottom half, or yeah, just looking at your domain is usually the easiest way to make that distinction. Okay, but that one right there gets you three marks for this part. And then part C, find an expression for the inverse function evaluated at three eighths. If you've done part, um, part B correctly, this is not too challenging because we've got our inverse function all we need to do is substitute in three out of eight and we can evaluate an answer. You can just put this through your calculator and get the correct answer. Or if you wanna be really fancy, you can say this is um, one minus six eighths. So it's two eighths, which is a quarter. The square root of a quarter is a half. So we have one minus a half. So we have a half. Okay, one mark. But again, if you didn't do part B correctly, it's pretty hard to get one mark for this one because you don't have an inverse function to use. Okay, that was E3. I think our next one is the last one for today. This is a pretty challenging one. It's got E3 parts and some E4. So this is students who were getting this question correctly in 2007 were typically scoring in the 80 to 90% range. So it's a tough one. Starting off with our function, e to the x minus e to the minus x. First part for one mark is to show that f of x is increasing for all values of x. Okay, once you know how to do calculus, the easiest way to show that something is always increasing is to look at the derivative. If the first derivative is always positive, that means you are always increasing. That's what we're gonna do for this one. We're gonna find the derivative and try and explain why that is always positive. Okay, so differentiating. The derivative of e to the x is still e to the x. For the e minus e to the minus x, we leave this the same, but then we multiply it by the derivative of the power. The derivative of negative x is a negative one, and that's why I've multiplied that part by minus one. Okay, if that makes no sense, I do have a video on how to differentiate exponentials on my channel, which could be of use to you. All right, that minus one turns that into a positive, and now we have e to the x plus e to the minus x. Now, e to the x and e to the minus x, if you're not sure what they look like, put them into Desmos, and you'll see that these two functions are always above the x-axis. This is an exponential growth model. This is exponential decay, but they're both um, functions that never become negative, all right? So we've got something that's always positive, plusing with something that's always positive, which means that the result must be always positive. Okay, so if this is always positive, and so is that, then the whole thing is always positive. The first derivative is always positive, which means the function is always increasing. Okay, if you're increasing, your first derivative is positive. Okay, for part two, the really challenging part, find the inverse function and show that it's this. So once again, we're taking our function, we're swapping the variables, and we're trying to rearrange to obtain this. Let's have a go start off with our function, we're changing the powers of x to powers of y, changing the left-hand side to be an x, and now we are going to try and make y the subject of this, which is pretty challenging. The way we're gonna do it is by taking our equation and we're gonna multiply everything by e to the power of y, and you'll see why in a second. Uh, on the left, we get x e to the y. Here we get e to the y times e to the y, which is e to the two y, because we're adding the powers. And here, if we add the powers, minus y plus y is equal to zero. So we end up with um, x e to the y on the left, 
This is e to the 2y, which is the same thing as e to the y squared, which is going to come in later. On the end here, we have minus e to the power of 0. Anything to the power of 0 is 1, and that's why there's a 1 there. Okay, now we're going to put everything um, on one side. So we're going to leave that here. We're going to bring the x e to the y across the right to join its friends and make it negative. Swap the sides so we have this equal to 0. The reason we're doing this is because we need to sort of look back and see that this is actually now a quadratic equation, sort of. We've got e to the y squared minus something times e to the y minus 1 equals 0, which we're going to write like this. Okay, we can make this look a little bit more quadratic-y by making a substitution and turning these e to the y's into something else. Let's just call it u. So now if we write that as u, we get u squared minus x u minus 1 equals 0. Now this is a quadratic, we obviously can't factorize it because the x and the minus 1 are a bit too hectic. We can use the quadratic formula here. So we're going to use the quadratic formula to solve for u, which is going to get u by itself. So we have minus b right here, plus minus the square root. If we take minus x and square it, we get x squared. Minus 4 times 1 times minus 1, and on the bottom we have 2 times 1. Alright, this is already starting to look like our, our targets, we know we're doing something right. We're going to simplify the inside here to write this as x squared plus 4. On the bottom we've got 2. And on the left where we had a u, we're going to back substitute and say that u is actually e to the power of y. So it looks like this. Okay, now to get the y by itself, we're going to get rid of the e. And the way we do that is by doing the opposite of e to the power of, which is um, the natural log of e. Before we do that, I think we're going to figure out whether we're going to have a plus or a minus here and hopefully explain why we want the plus because looking at the target, there's a plus and not a minus. So let's say um, if x is equal to square root of x squared, all right, hopefully that makes sense, squared, square root, cancel out as long as x is positive, which for a logarithm is always going to be. Okay, that means that x is going to be less than the square root of x squared plus 4. We're taking this equation and we're making the right hand side bigger by making it plus 4 which means now the right-hand side is bigger than the left-hand side. Now if we bring that across the left-hand side, we have x take away the square root of x squared minus 4 is less than 0. Now this is a problem because this means that if there's a minus here, the top of this fraction is negative using this argument here. And we can't have the top being negative because e to the power of y is always positive as we explained in part a. Alright, so for this reason, the minus in our answer here doesn't really make sense and that's why it needs to be a plus and that's why that plus minus turns into a plus which is what we want for our answer. Like I said, pretty hectic question. I did warn you, this is what E4 extension mind questions are like. They are really, really gnarly. Okay, so we're changing that to a plus. Now we're taking the natural log of both sides which looks like um, ln or you can write log base E if you prefer. Um, writing that as log base e and then writing the left hand side as inverse function and then we have achieved the target for three marks okay so if you fudge this plus minus to a plus and don't explain why you've done that you're not going to get three out of three because you have to explain why one of these is not valid and one of them is which is what the question is all about okay that's the hard part of the question done the last part is to now we've got that inverse function hence or otherwise solve the function equal to five correct two decimal places. Okay, one mark question because there is a cool little trick to this. We're going to just say, all right, so if we're solving this function equal to five, what we're going to do now is we're going to take both sides of this function and we're going to do the inverse function of it. Okay, inverse function of the left, inverse function of the right. Because on the left, when you do the inverse function of the function, by definition, they cancel each other out and you're left with x. So to solve for x, all we need to figure out is, because um, we're solving for x up here, to solve for x, all we need to do is the inverse function evaluated at 5. We have the inverse function, we've just got to chuck in 5 and get an answer. So we take our answer from part 2, we sub in 5, we put it through the calculator, and to two decimal places we get about 1.65. Okay, so pretty hectic question, but as long as you know this trick, you can get to your answer very quickly just by cancelling out the function, using the inverse, and just trying to see how part b relates to part c. So some of these more um, upper level questions, the real trick is seeing how the three parts of the question linked towards each other because they are designed to sort of scaffold your way to the answer. Okay, hopefully that made some sense. Hopefully that made you a little bit better at um, working with inverse functions. And um, thanks for watching. I'll catch you guys in the next extension one video. If you have any requested topics or requested revision topics, let me know in the comments and I'll see what I can do when I find the time. Uh, bye for now, not forever.